Welcome back to Real Talk with Susan Stone and Christina Supler. We're full-time moms and attorneys bringing our student defense legal practice to life with real candid conversations. Today's topic is failure to launch. We're so pleased today to be joined by Dr. Mark McConville. Dr. McConville is a family clinical psychologist in private practice here in Cleveland, Ohio. He's lectured and published on child development and parenting across the country. And within his private practice, he has really earned a reputation as the preeminent psychologist for working with patients, young adults primarily, who are struggling with this adolescent to adult transition, a phenomenon he's labeled failure to launch. So we are so pleased to be joined today by Mark McConville. I do have to add, welcome Dr. McConville, that- Thank you, his, thank you. His, his wife was my daughter, Alex's kindergarten teacher. So Dr. McConville, we know you're a famous author, but to me, no, it's, you it's are like, Mrs. McConville's husband. That's right. It's like being married to a rock star. We we can't go into a restaurant without some young person jumping up across the way and coming over and giving a big kindergarten hug. Oh, that's so I, sweet. I love that. Christina and I had the pleasure of ordering your book on Amazon. And I still remember Christina coming in that morning and when I got to the final chapter and I read that letter you wrote to 20 somethings and I read the excerpt from your mother, I just started to cry. I could oh not goodness. stop crying. I, I just want you to know that. And I said to Christina, maybe it's because I have two kids now out of college and one who is a sophomore, but your book made me think about my own parenting, myself going through emerging adulthood, and then all of our clients. And it just brought a, just a torrential amount of tears. Mm -hmm. I, I so enjoyed the book as well. I have uh, a son and a daughter. They're younger. They're not in high school. But nonetheless, through uh, our legal practice and what Susan and I deal with every day, sort of know what lies ahead. And I was so struck by your approach in the book. You demonstrated such kindness towards these young adults who are struggling. Oh. And while your advice, I think, was so rooted in sound psychological theories, I also love that it just had such an element of practicality to it. Yeah, I think that's what that's what comes with being being at any line of work for a long time. You begin to tease out what what sounds elegant, but doesn't isn't really useful. And you discover all kinds of things that are quite ordinary, but are very useful put in, in the right context. And one of them, Susan, I certainly did not intend my readers to, you know, uh, cry heavily, but I really had in mind that people would understand more compassionately what these people are going through. Because, you know, if I put myself in the shoes of being a client, and, and over the course of my life, I have been several times, but if I don't feel gotten, if I don't feel that I'm I'm talking with a counselor who gets where I'm coming from. They don't have to necessarily agree with everything I say or think, but if I feel understood, I am so much more available for change. And so that's part of the premise of the book is that these kids often feel, whether it's true or not, they often feel that their parents don't understand them. And they'll come in and complain about that to a therapist. But when the, when the parent can get to that place of, uh, I can identify with what they're going through I can see the poor choices, but I understand them better. Kids are much more amenable to to the parents' strategies in intervention. So thanks Thank for the you shout for out. that. Um, can you help our readers and listeners, because we do put it out both in written and we put our podcast out, <clears throat> understand how do you define failure to launch? Yeah, well, it's, you know, I, I first have to tell you, I objected to that title but the publishers were adamant. They said, that's what we're calling it at the office. And I knew there'd been a movie. There'd been a movie by that uh, title. My original title was Getting a Life, as in, you know, get a life. But mm -hmm. they said, you know, that's gonna, that's a little too subtle. It'll be lost on some people. So it's, there, there is a, a developmental transition from the world of adolescence to the world of emerging adulthood. And, and they are very different worlds. You know, adolescence is organized largely around high school life 
even if you're a disinterested student, it's still in many ways, it, it's the town square where you live. And that life is organized, plotted out, and overseen by adults, by educators. It has evolved over the course of a century and a half. And so while they don't know it, they're, they're living a little bit in the Truman Show. You know, there's, there's a structure to, to, to the framework of their being. And when they transition out of that, they often find themselves at sea. So, you know, just to give a simple example, there are so many things that growing up, even if you are, let's say you are a highly responsible, effective 11th grader, still so much of the administrative management of your life has been taken care of by adults. And then that whole college application process starts. And all of a sudden you're expected to fill out forms, solicit teachers for recommendation letters, communicate with the college about roommate selection, et cetera, et cetera. And, and we'll see these highly competent kids just stall out because it's, it's a new set of ground rules. And that is often their first introduction. Or for kids who aren't college bound, maybe that first job, the job interview, having responsibilities that actually matter to, to a, a, a store or a restaurant. So there's a whole new, uh, you really are transformed if you make it through that transition by age, let's say 25 or 28, you have a whole different sense of yourself as in, in a sort of fledgling way, but as competent as knowing more or less what you're doing. And in that transition, you are fraught with experiences of not really having a clue what you're doing. And uh, unfortunately, and this is true more for males than females, often resistant to the kind of support and guidance that would make things much easier. I think that that's really interesting, the resistance to support <clears throat> and guidance. And I love at the beginning of the book, you make this observation that's just so insightful and in line with what Susan and I are seeing in our law practice every day. Um, you say that kids today, they worry more and they risk less, which really ultimately contributes and leads to anxiety, depression. And I know, Susan, wouldn't you agree Every day we're dealing with students who are depressed, anxious, they have ADHD, they've been in therapy. I mean, don't you think that's They're what we're frozen. We They're see frozen. kids who get to a point where they just freeze. They can't get out of bed. They can't go to school. And then we see the parents trying to overcompensate and say that's okay. And then when you hear the okay, it makes it, it reinforces it. And then they need a legal defense and we need them to participate and help us. And then we're told that they can't because being with us is too upsetting. And we're like, wait, we've got to be able to do our job with your child. And it leads yeah. to the cycle. What yeah. I, I'm just curious to hear your feedback on what got us to this point or contributed to this trend where adolescents and young adults, they're afraid to take risks and everyone's anxious. How do we get Great here? Question. Yeah. Well, first, a comment about uh, your the, the thing of parents in, in supporting their kids and not meeting with the two of you, because that's that's very telling. I, I would not, having met the two of you now, I, I would not see you as particularly terrifying representatives of the adult world or the re world. You, you you have, I know you're doing serious business, but you both seem to have a very receptive, kind of gentle, good listening sort of way. So for a parent to say, I have to protect my kid from that experience tells you the equation is not balanced. There's something out of whack here. The question of how this came about is, you know, we could do a symposium on it because it has a lot to do with how the world has changed from, say, the time that I was their age. When I was their age, 30 percent of high school graduates went to college. Today, it's more like 70 percent. When I was their age, had I chosen I could have taken a bus across town, gone to the employment office at Kodak, and have been making a living wage <clears throat> within a month, bought my first car within three or four months. I could have a down payment on a small bungalow by the time I'm 20. I mean, those were options. Those really aren't options today. The amount of education that you need just to get a foothold. And if you talk to kids with good ed four-year educations from good schools, and while some of them land terrific, interesting jobs, many of them are extremely frustrated 
because the the job opportunities, if they can find them, that they aren't they don't miss the, miss their fantasy. You remember these? This is the generation that we encouraged. Dream, you know, uh, Laurel School. Right. Dream, dare, do. Us, the, and we and it's a wonderful inspiration that we're that we're giving. And I think for the most kids, absorb it and utilize it. But we, are, you're seeing the ones, and I'm seeing the ones who that lofty aspiration becomes a millstone around their neck. I'm not going to live up to that. Yeah. Um, and and so it's it's harder growing up. Everything you look at, from the cost of housing to um, the sal- salaries of wages have gone steadily down since 1970. Just more, you have to be a much more sophisticated being to make your way in the world. And because of that, your generation of parents, yours specifically, has been the most supportive generation in history. And that's not a knock, that's, a, that's praise. Because we do in fact have kids who are willing to, you know, to soar, to, why can't I go to medical school? You know, the, the, why, why can't I become an international business expert? The kids have lofty aspirations, many of them meet them. I, I like to look at sports. Uh, I have a 13 year old granddaughter who is just happens, doesn't happen to be, by dint of extraordinary focus and hard work, is a, is a tremendous soccer player. But she has her full parent, grandparent support, an, an extra soccer coach, leagues that are run by dedicated adults. And I think, boy, you know, we had to go out and make our own team and coach ourselves and Keep call somebody from another school to say if they wanted to play us on Saturday morning. Um, so the support. So there's a reason why. Let's just take this generation of women athletes. Is imagine them playing a team from 1968. Uh, th- 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 it would be it, it would be cruelty. It would be cruelty yeah. because they are that. so much better supported. So so there's a lot to be said for support. We only hear about the helicopter parent, the snowplow parent. So parents get dinged for this, but in fact. By them, you know, as a as a cohort, your generation of parents has done an extraordinary job. You know, I have to share with you, my mother was first generation American. My grandparents all came from Europe to escape oppression. And my mother had a different attitude. I remember saying, I don't want to do my homework. And, you know, she would say, don't do your homework. It's your <laughs> education. And. You know, if I would wake up and say, I don't want to go to school, she'd say, your education. And so I took ownership early on and I was a latchkey kid. So I would go to school, come home, make dinner, help my sister. And um, I think about my own parenting. If my kid said, I don't feel like going to school, I'd be like, of course you have to go to school. The question (laughs) I have is, I feel like it's too, it's very late. Are there earlier signs in middle school, early high school, before that senior sure. year, you can see? And what can you do to prevent the struggling transition? Yes. Yeah. Um, so it's just a little anecdote. I, I was doing a talk, radio talk show, and a father called in and said, I have a three-year-old. What oh should I be doing with my three-year-old? <laughs> <laughs> oh my. At first, at first I, you know, my jaw dropped. But then I said, well... You should be sitting down on the playroom floor saying, come on over here, buddy. We're going to pick up these toys together. I'll I'll get all the, the trucks. Uh, you get all the puzzles. But it's that sort of, you know, that kind of parenting is takes so much more time and energy than just pick yeah. the damn room up and put the stuff in the, you know, wherever it goes. Uh, but to sit down and work with that child where you're really paying attention to the sort of just emergent qualities of initiative and ownership. And that's what your mother did brilliantly. Your mother was a good gambler. She was able to read her opponent. So she knew, <laughs> she, knew <laughs> she knew if she played that card that you would pick it up, right? But what she was doing was challenging you to take initiative and ownership. Now, a lot of kids today need more fine-tuned parenting than that. And even when you say to your kids, what are you talking about? Of course, you're going to do your homework. That's also that's very efficient parenting. And most kids respond to it. I'm, I'm watching my kids parent their kids. And I see that 
you know, we don't make an issue of schoolwork because it's not an issue. Of course, you're going to it's taken for granted that you're going to do it. It's out of the question that you wouldn't do it. So it's not a big they don't fight over a lot. But what if you get one of those oppositional kids who seem to come along on their own through nobody's bad parenting and they come along and say, yeah, it's done. <laughs> I did it in school. <laughs> and, and of course, they didn't. And, and then that's where parenting becomes high maintenance. So for parents, I, I mean, with the student who Susie or Johnny, who's been, you know, amazing all through school, has these dreams of going on to a prestigious college, <clears throat> involved in every extracurricular under the sun. But all of a sudden, senior year hits that that moment where there's a total loss of initiative, motivation, the student starts to shut down from anxiety about the future and what lies ahead. When parents see that collapse coming on, what what can parents do? I mean, what tips do you have? We we call that senior year collapse, actually. And it's a very interesting phenomenon because it's, you know, deep in the background of our consciousness, we all sense the passage of time. And, and the passage of life's ground rules. And that's maybe, other than, say, leaving home for kindergarten or preschool, where the ground rules change pretty dramatically, that is, a lot of those kids feel the hoofbeats of the future. Like, I'm not going to have this support. It's, and we see that more frequently with kids who have been on 504 plans or, you know, yeah. they've gotten, they benefited. You know, the, sure. those are kids who have really utilized that support. And in a, in um, some of them, in the context of a therapy session, will be quite insightful. Not all of them, but occasionally there will be a kid that says, I just, I'm afraid of next year. What if I just don't get up? And because after all, my mom wakes me up now in the morning or um, I get I always get my papers done. But it's usually because there's an email from my English teacher telling my parents that I'm a week behind or something like that. And that kid intuits, I may be in trouble. So the, the how, to, how to respond to it. Uh, I'll give you the template, the model. Younger, there's a phenomenon called uh, school avoidance. We used to call it school phobia. So you might have a, an eight or a 10 year old that just, they're hanging onto the door jam. Yeah, I'm not going. And the, the protocol for intervention is by hook or by crook, you, you call Uncle Vinny, he comes over, picks the kid up, puts him in the car, you take them to school, whether they have to sit in the nurse's office or, you know, in the library, doesn't matter. They they got to know that being in school is not a negotiable. Mm-hmm. And the great majority of those kids, I'm going to guesstimate 90 percent, they adapt. They kind of, their little brain says, well, well, I I, I guess I have to do it. And then they do it. The uh, Their other 10 percent, what they're signaling us, and, and the tragedy is we often don't know it until we put them in school and the nurse or the counselor says nothing positive is happening. You know, uh, I came in my the counseling office the other day and he was hiding under the desk. Then we know we have more of a mental health issue. We have a kid that quite likely does in fact warrant a diagnosis and treatment intervention for anxiety, perhaps depression. So it's a hard thing for parents because the, the kind of gentle tough love thing is often necessary to clarify the diagnosis, right? I mean, there's a lot of diagnosing that way. We don't know, and we see that with the same thing with the the high school senior, the parents who say, "Uh uh-uh, I'm sorry, you are going to school. You know, one mental health day a month, but no more, something like that. And, And a lot of those kids respond. The ones who don't are telling us, I'm not ready to move on. I have a, a, an ongoing quarrel with society about this. I have a piece of advice I've given a hundred times. I don't think maybe once it was followed. And, and, and the advice is, look, you've got a kid that's really ready to go to college from an academic standpoint. He or she is a good student. Uh, their SATs, their scores are perfectly acceptable. They're telling you they're not ready to graduate. Let them not graduate. Let them walk across the stage and get an empty piece of paper. It won't kill them, and it's easy to recover. How do you recover? You take a six-week English course at the local public school, <laughs> and you start college in January. And really, in most cases, unless it's unless we're saying real emergent mental illness, right, or or a serious drug problem that is just sort of you know crested. Other than that, they get their act together. The alternative 
and I I sent one of my kids to college on this. The alternative is they send the kid off to college anyhow. Two semesters, academic probation, six incompletes, two Fs and two Cs. And the school is saying, sorry, or they're saying, you know, I call it academic rehab. It doesn't have a 100% hit rate. It maybe is, in my patient population, maybe 60%. But it usually means take two courses at Tri-C, get a job. Uh, the job is an important part of the therapy because it changes how you feel about yourself. You know, the, the produce manager told me how much he appreciates the job I do and they need me this weekend because it's it's a heavy shopping weekend. And I'm beginning to feel a little more like I may have the stuff it takes to become an adult. And for that kid who then goes back to school the following year, it, there's a much higher success rate. So, and my point is a lot of that could be avoided if you let the kids flunk English and, and then rehabbed over the summer. The other thing is, if you do the two semesters and out, your self-esteem and self-confidence takes a massive hit. Am I, am I just a, all kids this age feel like phonies, but, but these kids feel it more. Whereas if you, the embarrassment of telling your friends that you've got summer school Monday, Wednesday, and Friday is just, you know, big whoop, as they used to say. It's not, it's not hard to hide. It's not hard to do. Um, you kind of get tired of, I, I had one kid who I mentioned in the book who the parents couldn't get him to come out from under his bed. You know, he, they, he just, uh, yeah, well, you get that, tired yeah. of being under your bed after a while. Well, I want to you know? challenge so. you on something. Oh, good. I'm wondering whether the system today is setting kids up to fail because we have them in high school in this highly structured environment and now college has absolutely no boundaries until a kid violates the code of conduct. There are no visitation rules. It just seems like there's just needs to be some better way to transition students. Yeah. I know when I went to college, look, I'm 55, there was some sort of visitation in the dorm where everyone had to be back and you couldn't have members of the opposite sex in your room. Are we when expecting? In college, we still had those rules and restrictions, and it was a big deal. It was really enforced. Yeah, I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. So, are we? Are is this even fair? You know, it's a it's a great question, and I don't know that I have a good answer because I I was sort of a witness to the culture wars that led to all this openness. I had one of my dear friends in high school went to college. I, I was from Rochester, New York. He came to John Carroll. And, and a after a semester, he transferred. I asked him why he transferred. He said, it was 10 o'clock one night. I was in my dorm room, lights out at 10 o'clock. I have the covers pulled over my head and I'm reading my biology textbook with a flashlight. And I said to myself, what's wrong with this picture? You know, the, 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 the structures that were carried over from the 1950s were the other edge of the pendulum arc. And, and then through the cultural transition of the 60s and the 70s and feminism, so much, you're looking at so many of these restrictions as just not useful and appropriate. And you are certainly right. It is it's at an extreme where when you go off to college, you better have a fair amount of self-discipline and self-regulation. And the kids who do are fine. The kids who don't are not. Now, one thing, this is, may not be the most elegant solution, Colleges do differ in the amount of structure that they impose sure. and the, the ground rules. And you could shop, you know, I'm not sure that's the basis on which I'd want to choose a school. But if I had a, a kid who I thought was a pretty loose cannon, uh, that might go high on my priority list. Um, what about a gap year? Because I'm a big oh, fan. Oh, I love of gap years. I, I, I love gap years because uh, there's a book by uh, a scholar named Jean Twenge came out a year or two ago. She's what you call a demographer. Uh, she studies generations. And, and she makes a very plausible research case for today's generation being a new distinct generation. She calls it iGen. They were born after the introduction of the iPhone. Mm -hmm. And then she goes through all the ways that that and technology generally has changed your life. And one of the things she noted that was fascinating, that this generation of high school teenagers, less drug abuse, fewer pregnancies, fewer instances of diagnosed oppositional defiant disorder, 
like everything bad about adolescence is settling down. It's not unusual for a 16 to 17 year old today to say, you know, I'm going to stay in and watch a movie with mom, with my parents. Or, yeah, I'll, you know, I'll play Scrabble. Give me a board. I'll, I'll participate. So, and the initial interpretation, Twenge says, is that these kids are growing up faster. They're seeming more like adult-like in their late teens. But she said, as the, as the research piled up, they came to the exact opposite conclusion. They're actually growing up slower. So they're more comfortable with attachment and dependence and the sort of mandatory distancing from your parents. You know, you remember the book from 25 years ago, Mom, would you please drive me and Sally to the, oh, Mama, I hate you, get out of my life, but first, please drive me and Sally to the, you know, to the shopping center. Um, is that kind of teens are, are, they must rebel. It's not as, uh, you don't see it so necessarily today. And so that gap year is exactly, I, I, you know, I wish it was like Israel where you have to do two years of civil service, right? Absolutely. Because there's so much growing up that takes place and you're not being measured every time. You're not on a timetable of assignments handed in and quizzes taken. I just think it, it does more to change how you feel about yourself. My kids both did gap years the year after college. They did a, a thing called Jesuit Volunteer Corps. And so they were doing social service work, but it was so useful in, in giving them a taste of being viable and useful in the adult world. It sounds like what you're saying is that this transition into adulthood really requires adolescents and young adults to have a sense of responsibility, self-discipline, self-reliance. And so for parents, when you have a, a, an 18 year old who's really struggling to take any take on any sense of you know responsibility for oneself, what are parents supposed to do now? I mean, the hard line approach of get out of my house, get a job, you got to pay your own bills and make your way. Do parents have to let their kids crash and burn fail? Or is there a, a softer approach to helping foster that sense of responsibility? Yeah. In your I, I call that the Archie Bunker approach, right? It's what you used to be called tough love. I'm, I'm not a fan of tough love, partially dispositionally. It's not in my character. I do think, I mean, this is the argument my book makes. You can set limits and boundaries and have expectations and consequences. And you can do that in a way that conveys tremendous love and support. So I'll, I'll, give, I'll give you an example. Of, th this is just so garden variety. Uh, not this summer, the summer before. I had a kid I'd seen off and on in high school. And he asked to come back because he was doing a lot of headbutting with his parents. And it turned out his mother had driven him to the session. So she was in the waiting room. He was 19 years old, a college student. Their, their argument du jour was, she's saying, you have a dentist appointment on Friday. It conflicts with your work schedule. Call the dentist office and reschedule. And he just doesn't do it. You know, he, I'll do it. I'll do it. Get off my back. You know, but, but he doesn't do it. And I said to him, would it be okay if I brought your mom in? And I talked them into it. So she comes into the office and I watch them go at it, you know, just to kind of witness the, the argument. And finally, I turned to him and I said, I have a question. What do you think happens when you call a dentist office to cancel an appointment? And he says, he looks down, he grumbles a little. He says, they get, uh, they get pissed. Now, <laughs> anyone who has ever called a dentist appointment, a dentist office, they are the most canceled healthcare providers, if you call them to reschedule, they want to send you roses. They are so delighted. So I said to the mom, would you be willing to call on speakerphone and cancel the appointment for him and reschedule? She said, sure. And of course, you, you know what happened. Oh, Mrs. Jones, thank you so much. Oh, no problem. You know, and we'll see him a week from Thursday. And I turned, I turned to the kid and he just he looks down, first of all, which is what you do when you're a little embarrassed. And he goes, oh, just, oh just that. Oh, oh. Well, that, that in a, a little, that's a little microscopic bit of the psychology of the transitioner. 
there are, there's this adult world. I sense that it has protocols, rules, structures, do's and don'ts. But it's like you you may appreciate this. Why one of you said you're Jewish? I personally I call it my synagogue effect. When I go into a synagogue, I have this, and I'm from my background is Roman Catholic, where there are all kinds of rules. <laughs> We and have, I have rules. <laughs> okay, so I have this thing of like, I'm sure there are things I'm supposed to do and supposed not to do, but I don't know what they are. And so I get this this strange sort of youthful portent of shame. Like I'm going to do something <laughs> stupid. Everybody's going to turn. And I know it's, it's like, oh, there's my old neurosis. I guess I could have used another year of therapy. But that's where they live all the time that they just like uh, the kid who comes in and says, my mom wants me to fill out this check for you. She, we owe you some money. And he takes out the checkbook and he stares at it. And after a minute, I say, so have you ever filled out a check before? Uh, no. And of course, he's so embarrassed. Sure. He's so embarrassed as if we didn't all go through that exact same kind of experience. But that is where you get, they don't, Kids don't often enough come and say, all right, mom, I'll call. But what do I say? You know, they don't come for that. Like, tell me the piece I don't know. So let me right? ask you, how do we instill in these transitioners, like the idea of what you're getting at? Like, it's OK. Just ask for help. Don't feel shame. Don't feel embarrassment. Just ask for help. Yeah, how well, we if they if they would listen to that kind of straightforward advice, I wouldn't have a job. Yeah, I, 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 you probably wouldn't that. have jobs either. Right, but yeah, so no, what, you're right. We would we'd be out of business. Right. So there's there are a couple of things you can do. One is that you can like I I think for no rational reason, parents are often the least like if I take you if I'm your kid and I take your advice, somehow the very act of doing so makes me feel more childlike. And sure. keep in mind, I'm only 20 years old where childhood is nipping at my heels. I mean, I'm I'm a kind of fraudulent adult at that stage. And so I am loath to do anything that makes me feel like a kid. So you might find an individual that doesn't exert the same response for me. Like it might be the other parent. It might be an older sibling. It might be Uncle Joe, you know, cool Uncle Joe, the Uncle Joe that everybody thinks is funny. And he flunked out of college before he went back. And so he may be more approachable it may be a therapist. It may be attorneys like you who are not mom and dad. Yeah. Um, and the, so that's one approach. And if you find, if, if you have a hit, if you find someone you do, if you don't, you don't. But the other thing is to, to be a sort of um, a, a buddy, like the, like the mom in my office who essentially showed him how to make that phone call. It would have not been good if she had just made the call without him around. But she did it in a in a framework that was kind of tutorial. Well, within a therapeutic environment, because I don't know that the student or child would have stayed had she said, yeah, in her you, house. Yeah, you're right. Might, might not have. Might not have. I mean, you um, were a there, great facilitator for that process. Yeah. One of I, the questions that I had on your chapter about becoming relational if you see that your student is hanging out with a group you don't like or maybe dating someone that you don't want the student to date, I know that one the kiss of death is to say don't hang out with that crowd. That That's like a invitation. Mm -hmm. So in terms of you want students to become relational, and I love those chapters, how do you handle it when you know the peer group isn't the right peer group? Yeah, well, there's no single fail-safe uh, argument. You can, you're, you're so right. If you say, I, I don't like that group, even, even if the kid were to, to obey you and to distance from them, that just means he's being childlike, like mom, mommy doesn't approve. So so it's, it's kind of a no-win approach. But you can do, there's a, a kind of questioning that therapists learn. And I recently heard it referred to as motivational interviewing. Mm. But it's almost entirely made up of questions. So what do you like about this group? Tell, tell me what, how do they compare to other friends you've had? How do they make you feel about yourself? What do they do that's interesting or funny? Where do you think they'll all be in five years? What do you get from them that you don't get from other people? That's the kind of questioning I do with pot smokers. 
Because oh. if, I tell them to stay, if I tell them to stop smoking pot, you know, I, I'm just fired. But I will say something like, I don't know, like in health class, have they said anything about what they think pot does to your brain? I'm just curious. So I'm not, I'm not asking a question about pot. I'm asking a question about health class. The kid will engage in that conversation because it's a little more oblique. So that's one thing a parent can try. It'll work with some kids, not with others. Another thing you can sometimes do is you you invite them over. You try to pull them into your circle where you can assess them a little better. And it's also very diagnostic. Like if he brings the girlfriend over and she won't talk in your presence and is, is nudging him to get down in the basement where the two of them can be alone. You know, I mean, again, it just tells you like, yep, I trust my antenna. But that's, again, that's there's no guarantee you're going to exert some positive influence. At least you'll have more of an idea. And often, if they are, uh, if I could use the word generously, bad kids, they're, in, they're into bad stuff. They're not growing up. They're doing a fair amount of drugs. They're lost in their video game universe. They won't want to come over because you represent a frightening part of the adult world that they need to insulate themselves from in order to feel feel okay about themselves. That's really interesting. I know that we, I I like what you refer to as the the motivational questioning because Susan and I, in a different way, we have to sort of implement the same strategy a lot when we're talking to our students because if we just come right out and dive into the big stuff, they feel judged or they shut down and are just afraid to be open. So that's, I think that's a great technique that you've provided for parents to try to use as well. And for us. I mean, we really, sometimes we need to spend a little bit more time with each student to tease it out. You know, Christine and I often do intakes together. And a lot of people in our own professional development have suggested that, why don't you guys split up more? You could cover more clients, make more money. And uh, in fact, all throughout our career, people have tried to separate us. Mm -hmm. And we say there's an advantage to both of us being with a young adult because maybe they'll connect to one of us and not the other or we can tag team and play good cop, bad cop. And sometimes I wonder if there's that psychological transition because there's two of us. We think it's a better model and we're not abandoning it. No, I could not agree more. We used to do that when I started my career. We did a lot of family therapy and we always used two therapists whenever the institution would allow us to. And for exact that, it gives you so much more latitude of role how you play, you see somebody really needs an ally, so one of you can do that without compromising the larger agenda. Yes, Susan, our decision is intentional and rooted again in psychological theory. (laughs) Well, you are two smart cookies, I gotta say that. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, geez. I have uh, have three brothers, two of whom are attorneys. One has his own law firm up in Rochester, and he just by virtue of his personality, because He's actually an estate lawyer, but every one of his high school friends, and I have to say me and my three brothers, when our kids were in college and got in trouble, we called Uncle Mike. And Uncle Mike was just a genius at sussing these things out. Now, back in the day, it was not um, you know, sexually related. It was open carry on a, on a campus or you know, getting in a fist fight in a bar. And he, he was just uh, elegant in the way he would help people and connect with them. and But I think you're, what you guys are dealing with is much more complicated. And scary, really scary. scary. You know, I had a kid who, he was actually a high school kid at a little Sibs weekend. And he was, he was urinating against the side of a building out of the way. Gotta go. Campus, campus security guy saw him and they had to lawyer up so that he didn't get charged with, you know, sexual, you know, whatever, a sex crime. It was just ridiculous. Well, let's talk about lawyering up. Christina, okay. we have a good question about that. Yeah, I mean, we, we sort of were often asked, like, well, if we, does hiring a lawyer for my child make my kid look guilty? Or am I enabling my child by spending my hard-earned dollars to hire these 
brilliant women uh, <laughs> to defend to defend my child. And you know what Susan and I know is that you know in this day and age, it's just it truly can be life altering to not have your child, <clears throat> have child experience a disciplinary proceeding or some sort of criminal investigation without having a lawyer there to protect the student. And so what would you suggest or how could parents approach this idea of, okay, this is serious, you need a lawyer, I'm gonna pay for the lawyer because you make minimum wage, but also not sending the message to your child, like, well, if you just screw up, we have the resources, we'll hire a lawyer. Yeah, and the lawyers can make exactly. Away. It's, it's a great question. It's kind of like, um, you know, riddle of the Sphinx. Uh, I, I can tell you the the, theoret the hypothetical or theoretical question is, is this scenario likely to prove in retrospect to be a learning experience or will it prove in retrospect to be traumatizing? Now, that's a theoretical question. And as you know, sometimes it's fuzzy and gray and you can't quite tell, in which case I, I personally would err on the side of intervening and supporting the kid. But I do occasionally see parents who lawyer up when really the kid needs to have his hand slapped and it's not going to be a felony and he's going to have to do, you know, service or something. And, and he would get the idea that there are consequences, that choices have consequences. But trying to make it's like a differential diagnosis where you kind of, you know, I, I often think of things like that. Like if I'm going to make a mistake, what's the one I want to make? And I would rather make the mistake that said, I maybe didn't need to intervene as much as I did. Okay, chalk it up, learn from it. But I don't want to, you know, the kid I mentioned to you earlier, the 21-year-old who went through this legal nightmare when, when he was um, 18, he's been traumatized by it. He's only now stepped back into the educational world. This is a very bright young guy. And, and so I, that's a mistake I don't want to make. Yeah. Susan, when we were talking about the book, you were sharing with me how much the ATM model just really resonated with you. Oh, uh, my gosh. You read my mind. We're mind melding <laughs> through computer screens, Christina. <laughs> so I got to tell you that chapter struck such an internal chord because I have actually had teenagers, my own, say, you know, you're you just you're like a bank, just stopping a bank. And how do you communicate? Yes, I work for my money. I'm paying for this. I get to say without being a bully, because that's the reality. You take someone's money <clears throat> my way or the highway, baby. Yeah, it's a really great question because it's there's two things involved. One is how do you as a parent change your thinking about money? And the other is, how do you then get your kid to begin to think of you? Like, my, my kids are grown. They're closer to your age. If I pay for... Well, Christina's age. <laughs> <laughs> my daughter's 10. So we're just starting to get into that period now where, like, fashion and other things and being cool and all of that. So, like, I see uh, the eyes ahead. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, if I like pay for the girls summer camp mm -hmm. my daughter could not be more appreciative she falls all over herself dad you don't have to do this are you sure are you sure and i yeah i joke around with her i say no really this is a way that i would love to be helpful now my daughter makes more money than i do so it's not like she needs it's more like i have a need to participate i have no worries about it but if she took it for granted Aren't you going to pay for camp this year? You I would have a whole different, like, whoa, I don't want that relationship. So she's she's over that hump. But you guys are dealing with kids who are not. They're in the middle of it. And so as parents, first, you've got to undergo the change yourself. Uh, I remember when my daughter was a junior in, junior in high school and her French class or something is going to Paris. And I'm a fledgling psychologist building a practice and I can't afford to send her to Paris, but I could not live with myself not sending her. It was the it was the old, I'm working my own guilt agenda, my own self-esteem agenda. Am I a good enough father? You know, which is, that's all my stuff. I should have gone and talked to somebody about it. But uh, until I got over that, which I did more when she was in college, until I worked that out, I, I wasn't able to have the conversation with her 
that said, so tell me why this expense is necessary. Tell me why it's important. I want to know what I'm investing in. Now that you're in college or grad school, I, I don't throw my money away. I don't, I don't help you out out of obligation. But let me know what I'm getting into. What, um, what is this? Where is this going to lead? Tell me how, why this is a good idea. So I really am being the small business banker saying you need to make a case for this. And you need to know that if I write this check or help you get this apartment or pay this tuition bill, that the, I am expecting a commitment from you to hold up your end of the bargain. So you're trying to get the kid to see it more as a transaction. You know, that word's gotten a lot of bad press. In, in the last four or five years, everything being transactional. But it is a more grown up way of doing, of, of forming. A, what I'm concerned about is the relationship, that the kid begins to see the parents as people. You know, you're no longer to be taken for granted, but you are people who have stories and worries and, and that kind of maturation, what uh, the psychologist Robert Kagan calls, calls it mutuality. Like I see you as a person just like me. And so your needs, your financial concerns are just as real. It's actually easier in families that have more limited means where the yes. parents say, well, we just can't. In, in families where the parents are really people of means and the kid will say, well, I know you could afford it. It's, it's a little trickier argument, but I still vote for the argument, which is that's not the issue. You know, the issue here isn't whether I can afford to you know, put you up in an apartment in San Francisco. The issue is I'm I'm a grown up and I like to know what I'm investing in. I don't throw my money around. So if you're going to be a full time student and and um, you have some, you know, aspirations, if not goals, uh, then I, sign me on. I want to help. But I this is a 50 50 arrangement. So well, it's, it takes a lot of helps. I'm sorry to interrupt, but isn't no, that what helps horizontalize the relationship and make exactly. it more even? Exactly. And you see, it's not as. It's not easier said than done, but if the parent doesn't get into that frame of mind, the kid most certainly will not get into that frame of mind. The, the record, I know I shouldn't keep records like this, but I have one parent I've talked to whose daughter, who's very bright, uh, well-educated, and is 49 years old and lives entirely on the family dole. Mm. And it's because how do we change it after all this time? You know, I, which we agree to disagree, but I'm just saying it will perpetuate itself if the parent, you know, and you're lucky if you've got a kid who who is a step ahead of you. Mom, I want to earn that on my own, you know, that kind of thing. God bless them. You know, your mother parenting you. So I guess one final question that Susan and I both we felt there was so much practical advice in your book, but also a lot of nuance that really, you know, invites parents to to be thoughtful and and hit and find the right messaging. So, I, I guess my final question to you is the message of parents telling their children, you know, you don't give up, and parents communicating that. How never do you never give up? How do you message this idea of okay, I'm scaling back financial support, but I'm not throwing you out. Um, I'm up on you. We have confidence that you are going to gain yeah. responsibility and succeed and all of that. Well, you you know, if, if I could push a little farther, you may have a child that you don't have that confidence. Sure. Actually. Right. So true. So it's you know, it's so it's like the finding the the love language for any given kid. And I'll, I'll answer it with a vignette. I had a dad, a guy I just love whose son was in his early 30s and was a diagnosed paranoid schizophrenic, barely functional, often in and out of small town jail cells, you know, being held for a night or two, sometimes staying in places where you can stay for the homeless downtown, sometimes under a bridge. And what this dad, and the dad had done, you know, he'd done lawyers, he'd done psychiatric treatment, uh, like a lot of paranoid schizophrenics, he would sometimes be cooperative, sometimes not. But his bottom line was, this is my son. And so what he would do every other week or so is he would buy a carton of cigarettes and, and he would keep track of, you know, he would make some calls to see where he was and he would go seek him out 
and sit down and give them a carton of cigarettes and just chat on a bench for an hour. And that was what he did because that was something the kid could take in that said to him, I still have a dad. Now, will that help or not help? I don't know, but it's the right thing to do. And it leaves open the possibility that I think any of us, if we feel connected to our parents, uh, if we feel loved by them. Even my parents have been gone 40 and 50 years, respectively, but I still feel loved by them. <laughs> And it still matters. So however you can for an individual child to get that message, and it'll be very straightforward with one kid, and it might be a carton of cigarettes with another. There you go, making me cry again. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's actually a beautiful, I think that's a beautiful message to end on. Uh, Dr. McConville, thank you so much for joining us. This was this was really a pleasure, this conversation. And Susan and I were so looking forward to reading your book, and this conversation has just been wonderful and, and hopefully really beneficial to our listeners as well. Well, thank you so much. It's really been a joy to meet the two of you. I I, I can't wait for my next college student in trouble to come into my <laughs> office. <laughs> well, I got, you. Just the, I got just the answer for you. Thanks to our listeners. We're so glad you're able to join us today for Real Talk with Susan and Christina. And if you did enjoy this episode, please do subscribe to our show so that you don't miss any episodes where you'll find more content on a regular basis. You can also follow us on Instagram. Just search for the handle at Stone Supler. And there's resources available online, studentdefense.kjk.com. Thank you so much for being a part of our Real Talk community. And we'll see you next time. Thank you.